We're here at the U.S. Customs House at the Bowling Green for part two of our look at this historic architectural masterpiece. Built in 1907, it was designed by architect Cass Gilbert, and it includes the work of many great sculptors of that time, both inside and out. In part one, I explained the exterior of the building in detail, so don't forget to watch. In this video, we'll take a look at the interior. It took four years to complete. In part one, I spoke about the Customs House being built before the U.S. income tax was created in 1913. Remember, in the early part of our nation's history, there was no federal income tax. We've only had that for a little over 100 years now. It was a time when the federal government's financing came almost entirely from the collection of taxes on trade, or customs, and it was estimated that 80% of the country's customs were collected right here in New York City. The building was meant to show that the United States is the greatest country on earth, New York is the greatest city in the country, and the Customs House is the greatest institution in the city. Cass Gilbert wrote in his proposal for the interior, the decorations of the interior will illustrate the commerce of ancient and modern times, both by land and sea, thus providing a series of themes of great pictorial interest appropriate to the structure. So let's head up the grand staircase and inside and see what we can find. When we enter the vestibule, one of the first things we see is the plaque commemorating Fort Amsterdam. The fort was built on this site by Dutch colonial settlers in 1626. The tablet was placed in 1890 by the Holland Society of New York. So the tablet predates this building and must have been on a different structure and then put in the vestibule here when this building was completed. Next is the 1991 rededication of the building to its current name, the Alexander Hamilton United States Customs House. It was renamed in honor of Hamilton, America's first Treasury Secretary and, as many of you I'm sure know, a New Yorker. Looking up, we see a decorative vaulted ceiling, open arches, and the mezzanine balcony. At the base of each arch are two of these green marble Doric style columns. And I apologize for these pictures because you really can't see how big and how majestic all of this looks. So you kind of have to imagine how huge and beautiful all of this is. Hanging right above us are three of these beautiful gilded bronze lanterns. Spiral staircases with these lovely iron railings lead to the upper floors and there's beautiful ironwork on the doors and throughout the entire floor. The main rotunda is oval shaped. This is the room where customs transactions once took place. All around the room are murals which were done by muralist Reginald Marsh. This is something else you have to see in person to believe. They are gigantic and the colors are so intense and beautiful. Um, my pictures really don't convey how brilliant and detailed they are. If you can ever get here to see these, please take the time to do so. The murals were commissioned in 1937 by the Treasury Relief Art Project. This was a sub-project of something called the WPA or Works Progress Administration. The program provided paid work for millions of unemployed Americans, from unskilled laborers who were hired for public works projects, um, to musicians, artists, performers, um, people like the artists who painted these murals. All kinds of jobs were found for people who could not find work during that time. Marsh hired eight young artists to work on the project. They all spent time on the ships and tugboats in New York Harbor to be sure their sketches were as realistic as possible. One of those artists, her name was Mary Fife, remembered in her memoir, she said, I would get up at three in the morning on a cold spring day and take the Broadway bus down to the battery where Reg would be waiting in the dark to board the tugboat, which was going out to meet an incoming liner. Reg wanted details of lifeboats, stacks, masts and rigging, sirens, bells, deck chairs, everything. Where her notes proved to be true because when you look at these, they're so lifelike and you really feel like these activities are happening around you as you look at these murals. They were painted in a fresco style technique. I don't know anything about art or art history, but I'm guessing that it's that fresco technique which has preserved the colors so brilliantly. 
So let's start with my personal favorite of these murals. It's of a car being loaded aboard a cargo ship. Look at the scale, how huge the ship is compared to the men loading the car. It's just incredible. It feels like you're standing right there looking up at the smokestacks. To the left of this panel is a representation of Vespuccius, or Amerigo Vespuccio, for whom the continents in our hemisphere are named, America. On the right is Henry Hudson, for whom the Hudson River is named today. Hudson sailed in what is today New York Harbor in 1609 for the Dutch West India Company. Historic navigators frame all of the murals. At the bottom of each is an eagle and olive branch sculpture, and at the top is the seal of the city of New York. You might be able to make out the windmill blades separating beavers and barrels. Beavers on the top and bottom representing the money-making fur trade upon which our colony was based, and barrels on either side, of course, for commerce and trade. Next, over one of the rotunda entrances is a depiction of a ship called Ambrose with a giant steamship in the background. The next mural shows workmen climbing up a rope ladder from a small boat into a door in the side of a huge cruise ship. A couple of small boats are in the distance. To the left of this picture is Adrian Block, who was a Dutch privateer. He arrived soon after Hudson's 1609 expedition, and Block Island in Rhode Island is named for him. On the right side is Giovanni de Verrazzano from Florence, whose name most New Yorkers know from the Verrazzano Bridge that connects Brooklyn to Staten Island. The next frame depicts a tugboat, Calumet, in the foreground of a giant ship, Washington. And I don't know if these are real ships from the time period when, when the artists went out and sketched for these murals. So if someone knows if these are the real ships at the time, put it in the comments and let me know because I don't know if these are made up names or these were actual names of ships that were in operation in the 1930s here in New York. Um, also, before I leave to the next panel, Reginald Marsh's signature and the date 1937 are also found on this one. The next navigator is Christopher Columbus. Now he is followed by what I think looks like the captain of a ship boarding from a tugboat. Way up above him, we can see the lifeboats hanging over the side, so I guess this must be a cruise ship. And way in the back on the left, you can see passengers boarding. Estebeo Gomez, or Esteban Gomez, as he was known in Spain, is our next explorer. That first name that I didn't say so well would be his real Portuguese name, as he was a Portuguese explorer sailing for Spain. We come to another entrance to the rotunda, and over it is a gorgeous depiction of the skyline, as if you are looking out from behind the Statue of Liberty. A big cruise liner is arriving, and you can see other small boats and tugs are out in the harbor, um, hard at work, and the lower Manhattan skyline rises over the island. In the middle is 40 Wall Street, which was one of the tallest buildings in the world at that time, at the center. And on the other side of the entrance is the 15th century Italian navigator and explorer, John Cabot. And another one of my favorites, a celebrity being photographed on the deck of a cruise ship. If you look at it, it looks just like today's paparazzi with everybody all crowded around with their cameras. There are a few microphones in front of her. I don't know, maybe she's a singer or she's about to make a statement, but it's a great depiction of fame. And then another 15th century explorer, Gaspar Corte Real from Portugal. Um, he completes the oval looking around the murals. So if you're sitting here and looking up at these, it's really an incredible experience. They're over the doors and windows, so you have to look up high to see them. And they're up high, but they're also really tall. And I looked to try to see what the height on them is, and, and I couldn't find it. But you can kind of tell from this picture that they are quite large and up very high. Um, they, they completely overwhelm you, and they surround you know this beautiful... Um, window, oval shaped window, which is underneath a dome on the top of the building. I mean, when you walk around and look at them, you really do feel like you're in each scene. If you just stand there for a few minutes and let yourself absorb the picture, you really start to feel the energy of the, uh, of, of the port at that time. Now the next part of our tour is going to take us into the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian. 
Now, my original motivation for visiting on this date was to look for items that belonged to Chief Joseph Brandt. Um, he was chief of the Iroquois nations during the American Revolution. There's a small section in my book about Theodosia Burr about him. Aaron, her father, was a strong advocate of allowing the Iroquois to return to their ancestral lands after the war, and he worked as a U.S. Senator to try to make that happen. The Iroquois, I think all except one tribe, fought on behalf of Britain during the Revolutionary War and were banished to Canada. Burr felt they ought to be allowed back to their tribal lands. Um, Burr, Senator Burr, was unsuccessful, um, but during that time he had his young daughter Theodosia, who was about 14 years old, hold a former dinner for Brandt here in New York City in order to introduce him to all of the influential people who might be able to help him with his cause. So that was my reason for being here, to want to see anything that belonged to Chief Brandt and we're going to see there are a couple of things from this exhibit. So let's take a look at some of the photographs I have. The museum's collection features items related to the Lenape people or Leni Lenape or Delaware as they were called. The map shows their original territory, something everyone in the New York, New Jersey area should find interesting and notice right away looking at this map is that the names of some of our towns were named for the tribes that lived here. For instance, look, Raritan, Canarsie, Rockaway, Hackensack, Massapequa, and there's many more. This pouch is a Lenape pouch from the early 1800s, and it's made with hide, quill, silk ribbon, metal cones, glass beads, wool yarn, and deer hair. The embroidery is made with porcupine quills. Can you imagine doing embroidery with porcupine quills? I can't. Next is a birch bark house from the late 1800s. It's a usable container um, made in the shape of a house, obviously, and the roof opens to one side as a lid. This hood was made by the Cree people of James Bay, Canada, and it's from about 1840. Check out the beadwork. It's a woman's hood of the kind worn throughout the 1700s until around 1850. This whole collection is full of some of the most beautiful beadwork you'll ever see. It's so incredible to come and look at this up close. Coming up next is something so stunning that when I first saw it, I was totally overwhelmed and I just stood there and stared at it in disbelief. It's a full man's ensemble worn by the, and, and I hope I say this right, Anishinaabe people who lived around what's today Michigan. The outfit dates to 1790 and it's made with birch bark, cotton, linen, wool, feathers, silk, silver, corp porcupine quills, horsehair, hide, and sinew. And here are some close-ups of the different parts. First, the belts. Very beautiful geometric um, pattern here on the belt. Really beautiful to see. And the tunic, incredible. I was surprised to see this kind of pattern fabric from the 1790s. Um, you might know that I make my own 18th century clothing, but I never saw anything like this in samples of women's clothes or men's clothes left over from that time period. So I assume that for some reason it wasn't, you know, um, favored by Americans, but was liked by the native people here. Um, the pattern is very beautiful up close and really in the picture, you can't see the beautiful colors and intricate design. So another thing well worth your time to come and see. Um, here's a look at the leggings and the moccasins, and you can see some of the pattern from the leggings repeated on the shield. Um, as I said, really magnificent, and you really have to see it in person to appreciate it. Um, just when I was overwhelmed by that, moving on, I saw something just as incredible, this Inuit woman's parka. Can you believe this? It's from a northern area of Canada, north of Hudson's Bay, and it was made around 1900. It's made from caribou skin, glass beads, caribou teeth, metal pendants, ivory, and seal hide. This is so incredibly gorgeous. Can you imagine actually wearing this? It's so intricately designed, and the craftsmanship in all of these garments on display is so impressive. And, you know, I, I looked at it and I wondered, how long does it take to, to really make something like this? And unfortunately, in the descriptions, they don't really talk about anything like that. So I really wonder how long it, it took to make um, this wonderful garment. Um, and at last, the item I came to see, the only piece in the collection that belonged to Chief Brandt, is this stunning pipe. 
It was made in New York in 1785, and it's called an effigy pipe. Um, effigy, I think, comes from um, a reference to the little figure sitting at the end of it. It's made from wood, slate, porcupine, quill, dye, and silver. Now, as I mentioned before, Brandt was a Mohawk chief, um, Joseph Brandt. He was chief of the Iroquois people and friends with then Senator Aaron Burr. After the American Revolutionary War, the Iroquois people were banished to Canada for their support of the British. Chief Brandt traveled to Philadelphia when it was the nation's capital and also to New York to garner support for the return of his people to their ancestral lands. Burr was unsuccessful in his attempts to get the government to grant their return. But while Brandt was in New York, young Theodosia Burr held a formal state dinner for him at the Burr home. He remembered this fondly, and when Theodosia was married, she and her husband, Joseph Alston, visited Chief Brandt in Canada on their honeymoon. Um, the collection is much larger than what I've shown you here. Unfortunately, I didn't take many pictures while I was there, um, and that was just before the pandemic and the museum closed down. But the museum has reopened, so if you visit New York, it's worth your time to see it. On the way out, we pass another of my favorite spots, the gift shop. Now, I often use the restrooms here after my tour, so this is kind of a hint. If you're in the area and you need to use a restroom, there are restrooms in the museum. Um, I always find something to buy when I'm in the gift shop, and I actually like to buy something in order to help support the museum. So if you visit, please see the gift shop. They have some really nice items in there from very inexpensively priced things to really wonderful um, and far more expensive things and just about everything you can imagine in the middle. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed our look at the museum, um, please like my video, tell other people about it, share it, and subscribe to the channel. Um, I hope you'll join me again for more about the history of New York City. And if you're coming here or you are here, um, join me in person for a tour. You can check out my tours at PatriotToursNYC.com. And of course, if there's something you'd like me to do a video about, let me know in the comments. So until next time, I'm Karen Q. And um, I spend my time documenting the great history of New York City. Um, see you again soon.